Okay. So, well, first off, welcome. Um, in this class, we're going to be talking about sovereignty and entosis and sort of the, the basics about how to take and hold space and uh, how to control your own little space empire. So, presentation will start. So, what we'll be talking about basically is how sovereignty works. Uh, what does it do? How do you take it? And then leading on from that, Entosis, what the Entosis minigame is, and sort of how hard runs Entosis apps. Um, yeah, so we're going to go into detail basically is what the point of, of sovereignty, how the system itself works, uh, what the point is, what the benefit is to the players, uh, and then how to basically manipulate it, how to take it, how to hold it, and, uh, and how to make use of it. So what is sovereignty? So the basic definition of sovereignty is for a system that allows players to control space. So a lot of people probably know that there's three kinds of space in EVE. Um, there's high security, low security, and null security. But there's actually null security is broken into two separate subgroups. There's NPC null and sov null. Um, so again, they're easy to tell apart. If you look at the, the, the sov maps you'll see online and dotlan and stuff like that, you can tell that um, for the for the sovereignty systems, they're going to be those big colored ones with alliance names on them. You can see on the presentation slide, you can see darkness there in the uh, in the top left. You can see us down there below them with the red pandemic horde. You see Moa, Pure Blind, or friends at Circle of Two and Test. You can see that they're 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 sob systems. They those are the space that people have sob or control over. Um, NPC node, on the other hand, is kind of like high sec in that it's run by the NPCs. There's no concord and stuff there, but the, the stations and the systems, they're all controlled. You can't take it over for yourself. And those would be the systems that you can see Vino. There's a little pocket of space there with no sovereignty on it. That's NPC null. So we're going to be dealing mostly with sob null here and what the difference is with sob null and what sob null means. Um, so the real main difference between sob null and NPC null is that sob null can be improved whereas NPC null is always kind of the same. So the benefits of, of holding sovereignty and controlling sovereignty in nullsec is that it literally puts you on the map. So we all, can, you can go to, I think sob.space is the website you can go to where you can view uh, the daily sob maps which basically show all the different empires in EVE and where their space is, where they control. Um, one of the funnest things about it during World War B was a gif that people used to link of uh, the goons, goons empires basically shrinking, shrinking, shrimping um, over the over the course of World War B. Um, which again is is always interesting to see that progression. You can see the the huge massive Imperium, this big yellow blob over in the left hand corner, top left hand corner of the map, and that just gets smaller, and smaller, and smaller as the, as the war goes on. Um, you can improve your space, so that's one of the big differences between NPC null and and sob null is that NPC uh, sob null can be improved. You can make it better for ratting, better for mining, and stuff like that. And we'll cover that more later on, but that's one of the main benefits of it. Um, you can also more easily set up and run structures, so pauses or player-owned star bases and uh, citadels and stuff can be easier set up in systems that you control the sovereignty of. Um, we we'll talk again more about this later on. Um, you can also better control traffic and access around your space by setting up jump bridges, uh, sino jammers, stuff like that. Um, you sov is, is, is essential for setting up those, which again make the running of sort of a space empire and a space region a lot easier. And um, and again, you can control station and service accesses. Uh, we'll, we'll see that um, again later on. But as you know yourselves, pretty much a lot of sov null systems have, have stations in them. And if the station is owned by somebody that doesn't like you, you can't dock. So that's another benefit to controlling sovereignty. I say Robert is saying there's nothing being said in mumble. Robert is not the channel. Is he? Everybody can hear me, right? I'm not talking to myself. No, he's fine. I can hear you. We can hear you just fine. Okay, alright. Okay, we'll continue. Uh, Robert, I think something's up with your mumble. But I just said that and he can't hear me. Okay, we'll move on. So SOV is basically broken up into three main SOV structures. So the main SOV structures, and you'll see this in um, in any system you jump into with, with, with sovereignty in NullSec, is the TCU, or the Territorial Claim Unit, the Infrastructure Hub, or iHub, and the Station. So if you're in space right now in any system, you're in 7RM, you look up in the top left-hand corner, you're going to see three little 
Scooty Bean icons for Pandemic Core, and you're going to see the ones, the, the left hand ones, the TCU, the middle ones, the iHub, and the right hand ones, the station. You're also going to see a shield next to that, but we'll talk about that in a second. So basically, sovereignty is revolves around these three structures and basically capturing and controlling these three structures. Um, each of them has their own little job, and some of them are more important than others, but they all, they're all important to controlling sovereignty. So going from left to right, the territorial claim unit is pretty well named. It is basically a unit which allows you to claim territory. Um, it is essentially what plants your flag. The SOV maps you'll see on SOV.space and on Eve News 24, all these SOV maps that people post and on, on the Eve Reddit and stuff like that, that is purely who controls the TCU in that space. So if everybody controls the TCUs, that means it's a horror system. If we all have all the TCUs in Fade or in Pure Blind or wherever we own, that's what basically puts that big red blob on the map that says Pandemic Horde. Um, it also has a passive benefit, which reduces... Um... Sorry, Robert's having some issues. Let's keep going. Um, so it reduces your past fuel consumption, which is, which is handy for, uh, for a player on star bases. I believe it has a 25% reduction. Now, again... Not going to go too much into details, but basically any any thing you anchor in space, like a pass or, or a citadel, requires fuel to operate, which again, your alliance has to pay for, so that reduces it. So it's it's cheaper to have space or control the space where you can basically put up a stair base. Um, we also have uh, after then the infrastructure hub. So the infrastructure hub would be one of the most important ones as far as as far as uh, controlling space and operating space goes. So the infrastructure hub basically allows you to increase the quality of your space. So if we take, I'm sure a lot of you know GME or are from GME or live a little bit in GME or at least rat in GME. Um, when you're ratting up in GME, you have a certain amount of, of combat anomalies you can see in space. So you have your your Serpentis Havens, your Forlorn Hubs, your Forsaken Rally Points, stuff like that you can warp to and you kill rats in. Um, well, basically that's all controlled by the iHub. So basically rat, rats and rat, ratting anomalies will spawn in space. And there will be a certain limit of them. There might be only, I'm, I'm not sure the exact numbers, maybe two havens or three hubs, stuff like that. And basically people have to spread themselves up between that. But if you control the iHub in that system, and if you upgrade the iHub, now the iHub can be upgraded by actually manufacturing, producing actual upgrades, which can be plugged into the iHub, it'll increase the amount of rat spawns. So you can increase the amount of havens. You also need four or five havens, where you used to have one before. You can have basically the same thing for mining anomalies. Now, again, I, I don't mine. I don't know what the mining anomalies are called or how they work, you know, ice belts, stuff like that, or shattered asteroids. I don't know what they are. But basically, you can you increase the number of them basically allowing more people to use your space and to better use your space. Um, it, having more anomalies basically allows more ratters to be in a system, more miners to be basically generating income for themselves and as such for the Alliance by generating a tax, because we're all 10% tax, 10% of that goes to, goes to the Alliance. So improving your space has a knock-on benefit that way. Um, the infrastructure hub also allows one of the most important things for, for logistics-wise, uh, for space holding, uh, for holding a region, which is jump bridges and sino jammers. Now, sino jammers less so, uh, but jump bridges are vastly important. Um, I'm sure from being in Horde, you've all used jump bridges. You've all gone from RQH to 7RM or from FTACN to C4C. Jump bridges are um, a core to... Uh, to moving ships around a region for getting your fleet from from 7RM to GME really quickly to, to, to stop a, some some big massive ganking crew that's jumped in there and you need to you need to save some ratting carrier stuff like that it very important for infrastructure wise uh, of a region for jump bridges and stuff like that and that's also controlled by the infrastructure hub um, and again a station then Station is a station. Uh, they're less important now that we have citadels and stuff like that. But again, they're they're cheaper to run than citadels. But you know, a station has certain services in it. Uh, you can limit access basically if you control it. So if I control the station in Seven RM, which is a terrible station but still is a station, you can restrict it that only people with good reputation to hoard can can jump in there. You can't have people from CO2 or test popping clones inside in that station. You can't have them popping ships in there and stuff like that. So if you were a smaller group, you can control basically who has access to your space, who has access to your station, stuff like that. So that's that's the benefit of that. Um, now, on the on the flip side of these, and, and we'll get into more of this later on when we're actually talking about entosis and capturing space, but 
attacking these also disables whatever benefits they give. So if you're in a situation like at the moment, we've taken the iHub in Yumi. And so in our campaign in tribute at the moment against CO2 and test, um, Northern Coalition, uh, NCDOT, has captured the infrastructure hub. Now, I'm not too sure if they did or not, but if CO2 had any jump bridges that were operating in that, in that system, they're now down. They're gone. They're offline. That's that's how it works. So just because you have the ability to build it, and then you build a jump bridge, and then the hub goes offline, they don't stay online. They're completely offline. So these benefits are, are sort of on and off. And when they're off, it doesn't matter if you have existing infrastructure there and stuff already built. It doesn't matter. They're all offline. So um, it can really, really hit the lines hard if you take down a core system. Like, for example, if somebody took a 7RM, just captured the iHub, jumped in one day, just took out the iHub alone, all of a sudden our jump bridge to, to ORCUH wouldn't work. Or beans couldn't get in from, from high sec into, into 7RM easily. They'd have to go through gates, more people getting ganged. They have real knock-on effects. So they, they, are, they are important systems. So I have a question that I didn't see. Um, what's this question? Oh, thank you. Enormous and colossal are the names of the asteroid anomalies. Thank you. Um, so we have our token uh, miner in the class. So there you go, colossal for the minings. So um, so next, the, the, the fourth thing on that list, and you'll see on the right-hand side there is is a shield. Now, if you're in 7 or M, shield's going to be full. If you're in GME, I imagine it's going to be full. AQME, around that area, most areas around here, you're going to find a full shield. Um, in the picture I have on the on the on the right, you're not going to see a full shield. So basically, what the shield is is the activity defense multiplier. And I'm sure over the last few weeks, um, with the the whole tribute stuff, you've you've probably heard the phrase ADMs thrown around. So the system that ADMs is is basically a way to secure your space. It's it's a system which is intended to allow people who use their space, who are active in their space, to more easily defend it. Uh, make it harder to capture and make it difficult for people to get sort of footholds into your space. So the idea behind an ADM is that these these increase. Uh, you'll you'll see the exact effect. We'll cover it later on, but they they have an, a a direct effect on entosis and how difficult it is to capture a system. But basically, depending on how much your space is being used, these will increase. So again, there's three factors to it. There's the military index, the strategic index, and the industrial index. So the, again, the military index is how many rats have been killed. Strategic index is how long you've held the system. And the industrial index is how many asteroids have been mined. So if we had a system like GME, for example, and nobody was ratting in GME in some sort of weird alternate reality, people were just mining, so we'd have a high industrial index. Uh, if we only had it for two weeks, might have a very low strategic index. But as months and months go on, and we hold the system for longer, again, I'm not too sure how fast it ticks up. But that would increase, and, and and all these sort of factor together into a maximum of six. Six is the highest ADM you can get, and uh, we'll see. There's a chart later on. I'll show you how an ADM six system is different to an ADM one, but basically, it's going to make a system harder to capture. And the higher the ADM, the better. Which is why we do gold rushes and stuff like that. And we'll cover all this later on in Entosis, but it's basically to defend space and and to and to make our systems harder to take. Now, um, so how do, you, how do you take sovereignty might be the next question you have. So it's very simple. If there's nobody in a system and there's nothing, there's no infrastructure hub, there's no territorial claim unit, uh, there's nothing there. All you have to do is drop it. You basically buy these modules, you anchor them, you drop them in space, you claim the space. Very, very simple, very easy. Nobody's hurt, nobody's offended, nobody's to fight. But then again, that never happens. Um, you're always probably going to be taking space that somebody else owns. Either they owned before and they don't care about it now, or that they still own and they still care about it, like CO2. Um, so, basically, Again, there's, there's a lot of systems I'm going to be explaining, and again, we'll we'll have a quick rundown of everything at the end. But a lot of system, every system in the game, has what's called a vulnerability window. Now, what this vulnerability window is, is it's a system where's to counteract the fact that Eve is an MMO that runs for 24 hours a day. So, say for example, I am the CEO of the largest Australian corporation in the game. And we control a vast swath of Australian space where there's kangaroos and didgeridoos and barbies and it's fucking amazing. Love it living there. And we go to war with some evil 
Irish uh, alliance who want to kill us. Now, the problem is that we live on one side of the planet, they live on the other side of the planet. And the the problem is that we we probably won't have the same active timers. So how do we know? Do I have to stay awake every night to make sure that these Irish guys with their Guinness and their potatoes don't come in and take over my space while I'm asleep? So the best system that you could think of at the time was the vulnerability window. So what this is is basically it's a window that I set up where my space is vulnerable. So I could set this to a time zone when nobody plays, which is kind of what the Australian time zone is, um, so probably the lowest amount of people playing. So a lot of people do set their vulnerability timers then because they hope that nobody will be awake and around for them. Um, or you can set up to your prime time. I can set up to when all my guys are online so I know if we're attacked, I'll have most of my guys there to defend it. So on any system in game have a vulnerability timer citadels also have vulnerability timers if you log if you undock from the bean star right now you'll see it's vulnerable right now this is the bean star's vulnerability timer is when it can be attacked we have it set up to be this time on a saturday because we know we'd have absolutely tons of people here to defend it if you look at the um in the top left of your system uh, depending on what system you're in you can mouse over it you can see when it's going to be vulnerable um systems have as in solar systems, have a vulnerability window every single day. Um, they're vulnerable for a certain amount of time. So for for Horde, at the moment, if you look at 7RM, 7RM's TCU, iHub, and Station are all vulnerable between half 9 and half 12 every single day. Every single day they can be attacked at that time. That's the only time they can be attacked. Um, you can, again, if you're an alliance leader, you can, or even a corporation leader, or you control space, you can set those up to be different times for every system. And you can basically keep track then of, of you could have a rolling thing so 7RM is vulnerable from half 9 until half 12 and then FTACN is, is vulnerable an hour later and then some other system an hour later so you could always basically you wouldn't have all your space vulnerable at the same time there could be benefits to both having all your space vulnerable at the same time means that somebody would have to spread very thin to take all your space having them staggered means that people could move from system to system but so could you to defend it so there's benefits to both sides but we won't really get into that but um, that's what a vulnerability window is but you're probably thinking well, that's that's kind of annoying. How do how do you plan an attack? Well, very simply, there's thankfully a great website called timerboard.net, and what timerboard.net has, and I'm going to link this in fleet, is basically it is a full list of all timers over the next uh, God knows how long. I think 24 hours it goes forward. So that's in fleet there now. Timerboard. Um, it will list all systems the region and what time they're vulnerable and also the systems that are currently being attacked and what percentage is the defender score I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute you'll understand those but uh we can see basically when space is vulnerable you can plan stuff this way um if you're interested in the current war that we're doing against co2 and test uh, you can type in tribute into the search bar and it'll show you timers for tribute uh, moving on So taking space, the main way to take space at the moment is entosis. Um, entosis is a weird and confusing word that, that scares a lot of people because it sounds complex, but it's not very complex at all. The entosis at its core is kind of like hacking. You're basically going to be hacking nodes to capture them for your side. It's kind of like... Uh, it's like capture the flag in in World of Warcraft. You know, you're capturing. You click on it, timer goes down. You capture. Oh, I've capped it. I've I've won. You know, you move on. Like a Rathi Basin in World of Warcraft, like that. Um, and we'll get into that more into the Entosis mini game in a second. But that's 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 what Entosis is. And and to do Entosis, you need the Entosis module. Now, the Entosis module can be fit to pretty much any ship in the game, except for interceptors. But we'll cover that in a second. Um, and the only skill you need is Isomorph Psychology One. So if you have a jump clone or the ability to set up jump clones, you can fly an Entosis ship. Now the only question is if you can fly the actual Doctrine ship that we're using for Entosis. If it's a Mauler, can you actually fly a Mauler or a Prophecy? Can you fly a Prophecy or a Slasher? Now most of you probably fly Slashers. You can have Entosis Slashers. You can have Entosis newbie ships. We'll cover those later on. Like any ship can can use an Entosis module besides Interceptors. Um, so the module itself has a certain amount of restrictions on it though um so it requires fuel it requires strontium fuel which means you have to have the fuel in your cargo hold and it will consume them to operate um again if you're flying in tosis with a horde op you will be given a ship with hopefully fuel in it and uh, to operate if you don't have fuel 
feel free to shout at your FC before you leave. FC, I don't have any fuel in my mall, or, or my rapier has no fuel in it, which happened earlier on. So don't be afraid to shout up if you don't have fuel, because if you go the whole distance there in a mall or something slower than what the rest of the fleet is, and you don't have fuel, you're useless anyway. You're just going to have to come back and get fuel. Um, so it requires fuel. It cannot be fitted to interceptors. Kind of sort of a gameplay system here, but basically you cannot fit uh, Intosis module on interceptors. Um, that's that's really all there is to it. Um, it needs to warm up before starting. So if you want to Intosis something, it will have to do one cycle before you can actually start affecting something, before Intosis will actually work on something. Um, it limits the ship's top speed to 4,000 ms. So some of you might say that's, that's very fast, and it is very fast for other ships, but it basically there's ships that can go faster, and you can't go any faster once you have an Intosis module out. 4,000 ms is your top speed. Um, once activated, the module cannot be deactivated until it completes its current cycle. So that's a very, very strong point. If you activate it and you turn it on, you cannot turn it off until it finishes or until you die or until something horrible happens but it will stay on it will not deactivate um and the final and most important thing about it, the intosis module is while the intosis link is active the fitted ship cannot cloak warp jump dock or receive any remote assistance so what this basically boils down to is when you activate your intosis link on whatever you're intosising be it a tcu or a station or a command node whatever you're intosising you are stuck there. You cannot leave, you cannot warp away, you can't jump through a gate, you can't dock in a station, no matter what else happens. And you cannot be remote repped, so no logic can affect you, no, they can't help you. Um, which is kind of what the Intosis game boils down to. The Intosis game boils down to kill the Intosis ships. Now, so, how exactly does Intosis work? So. Again, it's 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 not a very complex system, but you do just have to explain a few concepts, and then you can sort of get your head around sort of how it works. So basically, the the long and short of it is, is Intosis is a tug of war, is is the is the the very at its core. You're basically the the attacking team are trying to get the Intosis percentage down to zero percent to win and capture the system. The defenders are trying to get it up to a hundred percent. That's 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 the long and short of it. That's the very simple thing. Now, from a from a systems point of view, how do you intosis something? So the way it works is those three structures we talked about are in every system. You have your TCU, your iHub, and your station. Now, if you want to actually capture them, you're going to go up and you're going to intosis them. So for this example, we lose attacking. Uh, I think what have we got? 7RM here in the picture on the right. So we're going to attack 7RM. So we're going to get into 7RM, we're going to go to the TCU, and we're going to activate. We have one Intosis ship with us. He's going to activate his Intosis module on the ship, or on the, on the TCU. TCU, after 10 minutes, will go into what's called reinforced. Now, I'm sure you've seen reinforced with passes and stuff like that, but basically all it means is that it cannot be attacked for two days. What you've done by activating your Intosis module, letting it complete, and Intosising the, module, uh, the, the TCU successfully, is you've set up a game of Intosis in two days. In two days time, during its normal vulnerability window, so for 7RM that's half 9 to half 12, an Intosis match will start between you, the attackers, and the defenders. And that's what Timer Board is, is, is helping you to track. So when we say we're going to Intosis something to generate content or to generate a fight or to get a timer, that's what we're talking about. We're going to Intosis an iHub to generate a fight in two days. Now, sometimes you'll have CO2 defending the initial entosis. They'll fight you off. There'll be a fight then. Fine. But generating a timer, that's what generating a timer is. You go in and entosis something, in two days, it'll start this entosis mini game. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the entosis mini game itself is, as I said, a tug of war. So once something has been entosis, again, for the TCU, all you have to do is to activate your Intosis module for 10 minutes, not get killed, and not have any other people Intosising the same thing. The defenders won't be Intosising their TCU. Just once you're the only one Intosising it, 10 minutes later, bam, you've triggered a timer in two days. In two days' time, command nodes spawn. So what a command node is, is basically a mini Intosis structure. They will spawn in random places around the constellation. So again, a constellation is... If, if you don't know, 
this is in the picture on the right, that's the constellation the 7RM is in. So 7RM is in the 304Z TAC R constellation. That's the name of the constellation. And it is basically those, what is that? Seven systems. Five command nodes will spawn randomly in any of those seven systems. You have to capture a command node by locking onto it with your Entosis ship, activating your Entosis module, and letting the cycle complete. Once the cycle completes, you've captured that node, and you've pushed on your percentage, if you're an attacker or defender, 5%. That's it. So, obviously 5%, if there's 100%, that's 20 Entosis cycles either side to get to the top. Now it starts at 60% in favor of the defender. So if you're attacking, it's a minimum of 12 command nodes to capture and you win, the system becomes yours. Well, technically no. If it was a TCU, the TCU would blow up and then we'd plant our own TCU and then the system will be yours. But that's basically how it works. That's the, that's the, the, the simplest version is you capture 12 command nodes, you win. Now, of course, at the same time this is happening, Defenders could be defending, they'll be capturing command nodes as well. And every command node they capture pushes it back in the other direction 5%. So it is a bit of a tug of war. You're trying to push, you're trying to kill their entosis, but at the same time your entosis is capturing as many command nodes as possible. That's that's it. It's a it's a wrathy base in a well. You're trying to capture as many bases as you can, but at the same time making sure the enemy doesn't cap the bases back. That's it. You're pushing it towards towards the uh, towards the zero percent as an attacker. Um the Entosis itself will slowly tick up towards 100 anyway. It'll always benefit the defender that way. So if nobody shows up, it'll automatically, I think in an hour and a half, tick back up to 100%, done. Nobody's defending, nobody's attacking, doesn't matter. Defender will hold it. Um, there's a minimum of 12 to win. And uh, command node completion time is affected by ADMs only for attackers. And we'll talk about that in a second because there's a, I think there's a, a lovely table on the next slide that we'll talk about. Um, for a visual sort of tracking of this, Yeah, on this slide, so that that's like if you can look at the, the middle icon there for the for the IHOP, you see there's a blue bar around the outside, a little red bar, so that's the defenders or the blue bar, attackers are the red bar. And that's uh, in that situation there the defenders are doing a bit better than the attackers and they're slowly about to recapture their system. So that's that's what's as you're in the space and you're in the constellation, you'll see that around the around the system that you're attacking, so you can sort of visually check how what progress you're making. Again, if anybody has any questions, or if I'm going too quickly, or I'm just rambling, feel free to stop and ask questions. All right, do that either on here, or you can you can pipe up and, and mumble as well. I'll stop talking. Um, next slide. So ADMs. We talked about these earlier on. What's when, how do they work? If I have a six ADM system, what's the difference? So basically, we talked about there's two systems. One reinforcing a node that's that's generating the game of entosis by capturing a TCU. That happens by entosising the TCU and then the game is generated. For an ADM1 system, that takes 10 minutes. You just have to sit there with your entosis module on. 10 minutes later, bam, I've generated the timer. Two days later, let's rock. Good question. Um, yes, so the, the initial generation has to happen during the vulnerability timer. So if, uh, if I want to generate a game of entosis, I will attack the system in its vulnerability window. Now the game of Entosis could go on longer than the vulnerability window itself, but the initial attack has to start in the vulnerability window. So it could last for longer, but it initially has to start in its vulnerability window. Um, so, more questions? Yeah, no, if they're invulnerable, if it's not during their vulnerability windows, they cannot be attacked. They're completely secure during their outside of their vulnerability windows. If they're invulnerable, it's the same as citadels, they can't be attacked, they can't be, nothing can be done. You can sit there, you can stage, you can get all your ships ready, you can get a hundred guys in system, but you're still gonna have to wait until the timer says half nine in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, whatever the vulnerability timer is to actually attack the system. Um, so yeah, with the ADM, so again, for an ADM one system, it's gonna take you 10 minutes sitting there on that on that node, attacking it with your, with your Entosis laser before you generate your game of Entosis, before you actually generate a reinforcement timer and start the attack on the system. If that system was ADM6, that's going to take an hour. So that's 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 where the real thing is. You have to sit there in space, and as we said earlier on, you can't warp, 
you can't jump you can't be remote repped you can't do anything you just sit there with hopefully a fleet with you as well defending you for one hour just to generate a timer and that's that's between one and six now on the on the last thing there you'll see four minutes so that's the command node so as we said five command nodes spawn at a time you're going to need to capture 20 12 minimum if you're attacking command nodes if nobody is defending so if nobody is defending you're going to capture 12 command nodes at four minutes a pop so if you're one in total smaller in a fleet attacking a system by yourself you're the only Entosis guy there. It was a really quiet day. We're going to get one Entosis ship. You're attacking a whole system and nobody is defending. It's going to take you 48 minutes to cap the whole system, right? To, to go between, jump between, that's not talking about jumping as well between, you have to jump between systems to get every command node. But basically sitting there attacking command nodes is about 48 minutes. If you were in the same situation, Uh, if you were the only Entosis motor attacking system, but that eight system is an ADM six system, it would take you f pretty much five hours to attack the exact same system if the system was ADM six. Now again, that's kind of a uh, a number just thrown out there. To, in reality, the system the, the the tick back up to a hundred, the automatic tick back up would actually be faster. You wouldn't you wouldn't be able to attack it with one ship alone it would actually regen itself faster than you could actually untosis it down because your cycle is 24 minutes long. But that that's that's the benefits of an ADM. So if somebody wanted to come in and attack 7RM, if we weren't defending, it would take them 24 minutes to capture one node. That's five nodes at a time. They need a minimum of 12, nobody defending. That is still the better part of an hour and a half to capture all of our space, or to capture this one system. If we were defending, it gets even better because we're not a, we're not affected by ADMs. ADMs don't have a negative effect on us, but the enemy do. So they still have their 24 minute timers to ADM our systems, and we don't. So it's a lot easier for us to entosis, to counter entosis, than it is for them to entosis our stuff if the ADMs are high. It's meant again. It's 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 symbol or its meaning is to mean that if you live there and if you hold it and if you use your space, it's a lot harder for somebody to take it off you. Um, so again, ADMs will affect reinforcement timers, node capture timers, station services attack. Yeah, uh, the thing about Intos, I, you, you find I don't really talk about stations that much. Uh, stations um, aren't as beneficial as they used to be before. Now with the citadels are, are, are so easy and, and sort of fun to drop. Um, but again, you can turn off specific station services. So if you, I know we all have cloning bays now in, in citadels and stuff like that, but before it was only in stations. So if you wanted to basically attack a station and turn off its cloning service right before an attack is, is, is a handy thing to do. And you could you could do that. It would be the exact same amount of time to take to capture command or you can entosis certain services off a station. It's fitting service, it's, it's clone medical service, stuff like that. This is taking me another day. So, uh, Intosis Ops, and basically how Intosis fleets work, and especially for Horde. Well, the main thing is, as you can see in this slide, anything can be an Intosis ship. There's an Intosis Ibis there that costs about 17 million, and that's that's completely on the Intosis module and the fuel. He had completely empty, empty fittings other than the Intosis module and the fuel. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have a half a billion isk uh, Typhoon fleet issue. Anything can be an Intosis ship. Uh, there's certain benefits to some things over other things. Uh, you can you can look in the hard fittings. There's lots of different fittings for for Intosis ships. I, I believe any of those maulers. We like maulers because they're a bit tanky, but they're still relatively cheap. They're still tech one, and a lot of people can fly them. They're pretty good. Um, there's also Intosis slashers, which are cheap but very easy to kill. So if somebody jumps in and wants to, because again. And we'll talk about this in a second when we talk about sort of real core concepts to Intosis fleets. The main thing is to kill the Intosis. It's not to kill the enemy fleet. If you kill the enemy fleet, sure, great benefit. You've killed all their defending ships and now their Intosis is defenseless. Good job. And you've got a, a, a dank battle report to share to everybody. But the main thing is to kill the Intosis ships. If you kill the Intosis ships, 
if they've run out of Entosis Maulers, then GG, you've won the objective. The most important thing is the objective and taking the space. That's the most important part of Entosis. So making your Entosis ships harder to kill is a benefit. Um, you'll see a lot of Entosis Rapiers, which again are really fast. They're really kitey. They're out about 200k off the Entosis module, and you have to burn out to try and catch them and or scan them down with probes. Um, I've also seen Entosis um, fax machines, which are large capital ships um, with Entosis modules fit on them, which actually get like a... Uh, they get a penalty for using the Entosis module, as far as I'm aware, and they can see Entosis times of 50 minutes per cycle. If they're ta attacking command node, it could be 50 minutes on one node to cap it. Uh, but that's the benefit of, of flying a capital ship, is that you're very tough to kill, but uh, you get massive timers. Um, so again, the Entosis ops are, uh, the, the Entosis fleet is broken up into three parts. You're going to have your Entosis, which again are the maulers or the slashers or whatever you're bringing. You're going to have your scouts, which are very important on Entosis fleet. And you're going to have your fleet itself, which is the DPS uh, and your and your logi. So that could be um, what we're seeing recently: a lot of hyper frigates, right? You're seeing your fast rifters and your interceptors and stuff like that. Um, I'll talk about the benefits of those in a second. Um, and or it could be caracals and, and ospreys and, and whatever you have. But the the main benefits or the main jobs, the intosis is obviously intosis, but the scouts have a very important job in this and. As we said before, the Entosis nodes that spawn can spawn in any system in a constellation. So it's handy to have scouts in each system calling out FC, two nodes have spawned in this system, or uh, a new node has spawned here, or two nodes are here, CO2 are, are on both of them. You know, have it, knowing where your stuff is, because the, the point of the Entosis minigame, the Entosis fleet fights, are to be very mobile. There's lots of jumping between systems and trying to capture, the, ca catch the enemy Entosis thing and kill them, and then get your Entosis and defend your Entosis. It's it's very mobile. So the more scouts you have, the better, and they they do very important jobs. And you'll see a lot more scouts on Entosis fleets than you would in normal fleets. In normal fleets, you might have maybe two, three scouts. Uh, Entosis fleets, you could have five or six scouts. I've seen nine, ten scouts in some, in some situations where we have large constellations and you have a scout in every single system in the constellation calling out a new node, calling out enemy fleet movements and stuff like that. Um, but that is, that, that's the main point of an Entosis op is to capture the objective, not to kill the enemy, to capture the obje objective. Um, so, so the main tips to have with an Entosis op is Clear intel is invaluable. If you are in a situation where you are a scout for the Entosis, you need to know exactly what to report. You need to watch for enemy fleets moving between systems. If you see a massive spike of enemy ships coming into your system, you need to report that to your FC and say that they're, they're jumping through here, they're in the system. Give your system name, give how many ships are there. Reporting nodes. You'll see them anywhere in your overview. Uh, I believe they're technically classed as beacons. You should already have beacons on. Um, as you jump into systems, you'll see them. They'll be called Command Node X36 or, or sorry, 7RM Command Node, and it'll have a number after. But you, you'll you'll see them. They're they're very obvious to spot. You'll be reporting those back as well. The objective is more important than the kills, as I've said before and said multiple times. It's more important to capture all of the objectives and to capture the systems than it is to get kills. Which is why we bring hyper frigates and interceptors on fleets. Is because the main purpose of that is to basically avoid the enemy, avoid their fleet, avoid their stuff, and kill their entosis. If we kill their entosis, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many of us they kill, because we've killed their entosis, our entosis is still alive, we're going to win, we're going to capture the timer and capture the system. Uh, that's the main reason we, we, we bring the interceptors and the hyper frigates, is that we can basically move around very quickly, cap catch their entosis off guard, and move forward. In in this war so far, NC Dot has been doing a fair amount of the Entosis itself. I know we've been doing some as well, but it's mostly been at uh, NC Dot. Um, so our job is basically to kill CO2 Entosis, which which hyper frigates and, and interceptors are is perfect for that job. Because again, the worst an Entosis ship could be is is a mini Kawa or a or a, a, a fax machine, which is, again CO2 hasn't used yet. But uh anything subcap you can kill with enough interceptors, with enough with enough frigates. Um, sometimes no enemy shows up, and that's really why people don't like Entosis ops. At the end of World War B, when we were Entosising all the all the goon stuff and taking over pure blind and fade, the goons didn't show up. There was they'd send out a sword fleet, a load of interceptors them, themselves, and they'll jump into the system, try and fight us, find out we have more than them, and then they'd leave. And it was just 
sitting around in space and it was very boring and it sort of gave people a bad taste about entosis but it, it, it actually is quite a fun mechanic it can be very fun um, anybody can entosis don't be afraid it's very simple uh, it can be a bit boring at times yes but it is very simple to do don't ever be afraid that you're not skilled enough once you have a jump clone you can be an entosis smaller and um, dotlan I'd recommend as well. Uh, for those of you that don't use it, Dotland is the, is what the Eve map should be. Um, it is very simple to use. Uh, it gives you great indication. It's much easier to navigate. You can see what constellation you're in. You can easily navigate around things a lot easier. It's it's it should be mandatory really. It's something that a lot of a lot of people don't use and they're a bit afraid of because it looks a bit complex. It's not. It's a great tool for figuring out and it's it's invaluable on Tosis fleets. So you know what systems connect to what, what is actually inside your constellation and stuff like that. It's it's much easier than even the EVE in-game map. Um, timer board, obviously, for all of its timers. Like, you can look at the timer board right now. If you go to Tribute, you can basically see all the Entosis apps that will be coming up over the next few days. They might not be up on our forums yet, but you can see that um, Yumi KK, the, um, there's the infrastructure hub in Yumi KK is come out reinforce in one day and 22 hours so pretty much in two days from now that will be out of reinforcement which means that uh, we'll probably have to go defend it so there you go uh, you, you can see ops coming ahead there's a nj4x has an ihub that is coming out of reinforcement in 23 hours so this time tomorrow hopefully we'll have capped that we'll have taken that from co2 so it's handy that way so you can you can get an idea um, you will never have to join an entosis fleet again and wonder where we're going what we're doing because you'll have timer board up and you'll know oh well we're probably going to this timer this TCU is out of reinforcement at this time that's what we'll be doing uh, once I lost my presentation okay and um, Intosis spreadsheet so I don't actually have a copy of this I was meant to get it and I, I forgot that I was meant to get it there is a spreadsheet that we use for Intosis uh, if anybody in the fleet has it I'll be very surprised but uh, feel free to link it um, the Intosis spreadsheet is basically a, a mutually shared spreadsheet on Google Docs where everybody can mark in if they see, scouts can mark in if they see uh, command nodes and stuff and then modders or uh, Entosis ships can basically say that they're capping it or not it makes it the organization of who's capping what node because again there's five spawns at a time and you might have modders spread out the place you don't know who's going to what you show up oh there's already a guy here capping this one oh I'm going to hit this other one which is three jumps away you just wasted two jumps that sort of stuff um, it's a sort of a system for, for easily organizing that um, if your fleet is using it, if it's a big Entosis fleet, they'll link it. You'll see it. It's very easy to use. And finally, Entosis fleets can be awesome. They really can. I've some of my funnest fleets have been Entosis fleets from managing to decloak Entosis drakes that were sitting off of a of an infrastructure node that cloaked when we jumped in, and you have a hundred scepters just burning towards where this drake was, trying to decloak him. And you decloak him, you kill him. And he's like blingy fit, and you're just laugh. It's 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 fun. We had an Atosis op against goons when goons went down to delve, where we had a load of interceptors fitted with ECM bursts, which are ECM, which basically breaks target locks. And we jumped around delve on top of all these goons and their Atosis capital ships and broke their locks and again reset their 50 minute Atosis cycles, put it back to zero every time we jumped in. And it was some of the funnest stuff as there was hundreds and hundreds of goons in these massive capital ships that couldn't kill us because we were little frigates just being annoying it, 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 some of the best ops have been at Tosis ops they're really fun and uh, and finally this is uh, any questions I open up to questions now if anybody wants to ask in mumble or in fleet or uh, in the square I'll answer any uh, any questions that I can on any bits that I missed Um, is this going to be recorded and put up anywhere? Because I missed most of it because I got called in back into work to turn on a power uh, button. Nice, it's good. It's good to be needed. Um, yeah, no, uh, it is being recorded. Caliber is recording this at the moment, so it will be available on the Horde Square in uh, in on YouTube uh, with the presentation notes and everything. So you can watch this later. Uh, so, Mega has a question. So, lowering the ADMs by killing ratters and miners. Yeah. So, um, lowering ADMs, you, you can't directly lower ADMs, but they're they're sort of done on a sort of a running uh, a running average. Where basically, if if you have, for example, God, I don't even know what the actual numbers would be in Jimmy, if 
10,000 rats are killed every day, that could be completely off. But this is just a number. If 10,000 rats are killed every day and by the ratters when nobody's affecting them, uh, the ADM might be at six. But if all of a sudden um, I decide to start cloaky camping, leaving bombers cloaked in a system, and all of a sudden nobody feels safe ratting or people start getting killed in their ratting carriers and people stop ratting, that rolling average of how many rats killed might drop to six five four thousand and therefore the ADM will start dropping because less people are using the system uh, you can use that to your advantage in a certain extent if you start dropping cloaky campers in some systems but leave them out of others you're technically corralling or pushing ratters into other systems if they look at they log in and they want to go ratting in their carrier and they see wow there's there's three guys from horde in stealth bombers somewhere stealth in the system i don't feel safe Ooh, next door there's nobody there i'll go there instead they start ratting in that system instead, and all of a sudden the ADM start dropping in the system you want, and therefore it's it's easier to take to build to build that beachhead. Um, is bad, which is the it is the uh, the horde stealth bombing uh, crew did that actually. We were we they, they set up a jump bridge within range of certain ratting systems in test space, and they left cloaky campers in the systems they couldn't reach because they didn't want test ratting carriers to rat those systems. So they sort of corralled them towards what was in range of our jump bridge. So little be known to the test guys, they actually would have been safer in the systems with the AFK campers because they actually weren't really ready to drop. It was, we were ready to drop in the systems that looked like they were safe. Any other questions? All right, dudes, I don't know if that means that I was very good and very concise in my class, or it was very boring and you all fell asleep, or that it's you found out that Savanatosis is actually a terrible subject and you don't care about it anymore. Either way, my mission is successful. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, oh, can I explain the app just, that Travis just did? I wasn't in this app, so I, I, I was there when they were going out. I know they were taking rapiers. Um, it looks like actually from, I think I was looking at timer board before. Yeah, they looks like they reinforced the station in Yumi KK, I think. So in that app, again, I, I wasn't on, I'd only heard the start, I know they were taking out Entosa ships and, and frigates and uh, caracals. Um, it looks like, the, if you look at timer board and look at tribute in Yumi-KK, uh, the Circle of Two station is now vulnerable in two days. Two days minus nine minutes from now. So it looks like a bunch of Horde guys, Travis and uh, Catatonic, decided to go up there and basically entosis the station and triggered an entosis timer in two days. So two days from now, at this time, you will be able to go in there, entosis and, and capture command nodes and capture the station. So it looks like that's 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 what that fleet was about. Again, I wasn't on it. That's that information I'm putting together from timer board and from uh, from fleet. Shit, the class is actually quite big. I didn't I didn't have mobile open. Okay, um, all right, last call. No no more questions. Everybody good? Mad, mad hot dog, I cannot hear you. If you're talking, there's no sound coming out. Any better? Perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, what ship or role would you uh, recommend for a complete newbie to it? Well, like, for complete newbies, um, it, it depends. If you're confident enough to take, to take an Atosis Mauler, it can be a little bit boring at times, but it's so, hang on, Rage Pings. Okay, if anyone wants to jump on that Travis fleet, it looks like something big's going on, you can jump on it. Uh, very quickly though, um, as far as what, for new beans, um, again, the Entosis stuff isn't that difficult. Once you have a jump clone, you can be an Entosis guy. If you have the skill for jump clones, you can be an Entosis guy. It's not that difficult. You're very, you're told exactly what to do, and a lot of it is just sitting around looking at the thing and Entosising it. Now, you are a hero. You are doing the job that the fleet is designed to do, but again, there's not a lot of skill involved or, or detailed tactics. You're just going to sit there and you're going to Entosis something. Um, 
but then again most of the fleets that we take out as well will also be very newbie friendly and will take the the hyper rifters so if you can fly a hyper rifter i'd recommend that you're going to have tackle you're going to be jumping into massive fights it's it's really fun so for a complete newbie any job really can do i would recommend either taking the hyper rifter and going in and and being part of the dps or if you're feeling up to it going for the maulers um, the only thing you'll need to keep in mind is that you need to keep on on top of your aligning on 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 the journey there to make sure you're not caught out because you warp slower than everybody else. But uh, other than that, it's they're both it, they're not complex jobs. Don't don't feel nervous about trying something new and hard because it, eventually you will screw up. But it's not going to be that big of a deal anyway. Okay, thanks. Ed.